You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza and Matt Polachek, only on L.A. Talk Radio. Welcome to another edition of Answers for the Family. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza, and with me is my co-host, Dr. Matt Polachek. Matt, I'm excited we're both, both here. It makes the show so much more fun for me. Well, it's great to be here as well. I especially enjoyed some of the listener questions that we had last week. And for those of you that have been listening and sending in questions and comments, thank you so much, and please keep them coming. And please continue to help spread the word that every Monday from 11 a.m. to noon Pacific time, this show will bring you special guests that can inspire educate, and in some cases, entertain, while bringing answers and options to making your lives happier, healthier, and more successful. Now, this show will address issues such as locating your runaway teen, family crisis intervention, building self-esteem, dealing with addictions, and so much more. We're going to introduce you to talented authors and new innovations in the areas of health, security, and fun for you and your family. Now, Matt, today's subject seems to have hit a nerve with some of our listeners. I've already received comments from family and friends, some that agree with our guest, some that disagree, and one that said that they're very curious as to how our guest did it. According to the American Medical Psychological Association, healthy marriages are good for couples' mental and physical health. They're also good for children. Growing up in a happy home protects children from mental, physical, educational, and social problems. However, about 40 to 50 percent of married couples in the United States divorce. The divorce rate for subsequent marriages is even higher. Which poses the questions, what happens when your marriage is broken, but you're the only one that wants to fix it? Or what if you're willing to see a counselor, but your spouse isn't? What if your spouse's flaws are jeopardizing the relationship, but he or she refuses to change? And what about your own flaws? You know, Alan, conventional wisdom would say it takes two to make a marriage better and that both spouses must agree to plan for a change. Well, in her new book, It Takes One to Tango, How I Rescued My Marriage with Almost No Help from My Spouse and How You Can Too, our guest today, Winifred Riley, challenges the widely held notion that it takes two eager and willing partners to turn your troubled marriage around. Winifred is a psychotherapist specializing in marital therapy and relationship issues with a private practice in Berkeley, California. In her 35 years of clinical practice, she has treated hundreds of couples, many who are convinced they are headed for divorce. Now, she's been a guest lecturer on marriage and sexuality and has made numerous radio appearances and has been interviewed as a relationship expert on WebMD, HuffPost Live, and the New York Times. And her work has appeared in the Huffington Post, The Good Men Project, and XO Jane. What I love is she presents a positive yet practical approach to the inevitable challenges all couples face, believing that even the most troubled relationships can be repaired through proper guidance, encouragement, and hard work, regardless of how challenging their issues are. Winifred, we are so excited to welcome you to Answers for the Family. Oh, it's so nice to be here. Well, it is, it is great to have you. And uh, when I was saying that I've had people that have been providing input, uh, because this was, this was a holiday weekend, so I was around a lot of family, and they received the press releases. So there was some interesting uh, input, you know, some of which, again, were, were completely agreeing, saying, oh, yes, you know, I worked really hard, and, and I know that you can do it. There were a couple other people that were saying things like, you know, I can't imagine how this could possibly work if you don't have both in it. So um, share with us a little bit about, you know, what you did to make it work. And, and what I'd like to start with is, is that there was even comments in regards to the name of the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so, yeah. so they said, so okay. how did her husband uh, handle it when the book came out and it said, how I rescued my marriage with almost no help from my spouse? Well, here's the thing. Um, it is true, and the almost is really, I think, the most important part of the subtitle. Because, to my surprise, when I decided to experiment and be the what I think of more as a change leader as opposed to the only person doing anything, it was more like I think of the, the person who, who takes the lead 
changes first. That that was the role I decided to take. And that was it was really an experiment. It was just based on some theoretical ideas about how you can't change your partner and how you have to focus on yourself and uh, and the understanding that in a system if you change one part of a system, you influence the whole system. So I decided to experiment. My marriage was certainly uh, decent, but my husband and I tended to bicker a lot. And I found those circular arguments particularly discouraging and really made me wonder if I could go on. So I decided that I was going to unilaterally start to address our fighting by beginning to look at myself. But the thing that surprised me, and this is why it's the almost, is that once I started to unhook and once I started to relate to our interactions in a different way, so did my husband. But it wasn't because I was directing him or insisting on anything. It was just that it was there was more room, it was healthier, it felt better. Sometimes he'd be the person who would kind of drop the end of the tug of ro- tug of war rope. Uh, you know, sometimes he would even say, "Hey, I think you're getting kind of carried away here. Why don't we calm down?" That that, but that took time. That was not right out of the gate, and so that's why it says almost because I thought I was going to just be changing it all by myself. But then I was then I discovered that that's not the case. But that's the thing people are afraid of. People think, oh, I'm going to be the only one changing. I'm going to be carrying my partner's dead weight. I'm already doing more than my share, and now this lady's trying to tell me I have to do more. So people have these these reactions. It's not fair. People are supposed to meet in the middle. But actually, that's just not how it is anyway in most, in most things. People don't come to everything with the exact deg- same degree of enthusiasm. Sometimes you have a partner who's fearful of change or you have a partner who is afraid of therapy or actually in some instances people say I'm troubled by my marriage and my spouse says I think everything's fine or the problem is you and so if people wait for the other person's buy-in it's a much less empowered it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a much less, much less empowered position to be in. I like the idea that we can take things into our own hands and that it works. You know, the, the word self-empowerment to me is what just popped out of your last few sentences. Because I think about, you know, my own marriage. I've been married eight years. I, I don't want to think eight or nine. I don't want to get in trouble here. Um, but at any rate, one of the things, you know, early in my marriage that I noticed is I always wanted to try to control the emotion of the other person. Um, and I would get upset if, you know, my wife was not in a good mood or something. You know, she was normally in a good yeah. mood. But at any rate, the, the way you're presenting it really is much more self-empowering. The focus of being looking at yourself, looking to start with you and then seeing how it influences others versus is always, most people want to just point the blame to the my husband does this or my wife does this and look at the negative. But instead of this is a much more self-empowerment way of looking at things. Well, yeah, and you know what you just said is it's very common that uh, that we come home and there there are people who who talk about they come home it's like taking the temperature of the relationship or the temperature of their spouse. Oh, she's agitated, or oh, he's come home in a bad mood, or and and they're busy kind of wanting to control the other person. I write about early in my marriage having the feeling that. I was a radio, and my husband always wanted to turn down the volume. And so it's like, or, you know, bring up the trouble. And so people often do that. They, they want to, they, well, I, it's, we, it's much easier to think of how to change our spouse than to think of how to change ourselves it, or to change ourselves in relation to some not-so-desirable activity or attitude or action on their part. Now, um, I know in many situations when I hear people talk about, you know, what worked or didn't work for them, one of the biggest things that, that seems to come out in regards to what wasn't working is that they started to not communicate, that it wasn't so much what was being done, but the fact that they weren't communicating about it. Share with us a little bit about how we can get that communication aspect of it going again, even if it's not necessarily what people want to hear. 
Yeah, well, I think that is that, that last little be- piece, especially if it's not something your partner wants to hear. This is where the, the one to tango piece comes in. We have to figure out how to calm ourselves down in the presence of whatever is going to come next. I, I talk a lot about, it's like a chess game. I'll make a move, and then my husband will respond, and then I'll make a move. But in, you know, and if it's chess, we just make a move and scratch our head and think about what's my next best move. But in marriage, your spouse makes a move, and you say, don't make that move. I don't like that move. Your move is messing up my move. You need to move back. You need to change back. You can't do that. And so I'm telling people... Just make your own move. Okay, so you come home and you say, you know, we really have to talk about this. I, you know, where the credit card bill is running too high and it's making me anxious. And your spouse says, well, it's all about you and you bought the blah, blah, blah. And then you're, you're either going to get into it or you're going to take a step back and calm down and say, well, maybe we both play a part in this financial mess, but I want to talk about it now. I want to talk about what we can do. And then your spouse maybe gets all upset and you say, well, I know it's agitating, but we need to talk about it now. Or let's talk about it after you calm down. That you unilaterally control what's going on without being intimidated or afraid. Well, see, I can't say that. She rolls her eyes. Or see, when I bring it up, look, he makes that face and and we can't talk. So the communication has to be kind of a, from, a, from a place of courage almost. And, you know, not like if, if you want to come home and say hi, but if you're going to deal with uh, some kind of issue you don't really want to talk about or it's heated up, it's really each person's individual job to control their reaction and be mindful of their words and not throw gasoline on the fire and, you know, and not be so ignitable that when their spouse throws gasoline that they blow up or to be afraid you know not to you know to manage your fear so you don't have to shut down or run out of the room i have people who who talk about how the minute it gets a little tense they're so overwhelmed they just want to run away you know you've mentioned fear and mentioned overreacting and to me it seems like most of, and I think this is, you know, part of the book talks about this too, that anxiety really shapes most of our tension-filled interactions with our partner. Um, is that fair to mm-hmm. say? Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's, it, you know, and when I talk about anxiety, I'm not talking about a panic attack or, you know, sweaty palms. I'm just talking about the, I, you know, I think of, of anxiety as the disquiet and distress that we feel when we don't have control over things that in the present that's in talking that's almost the definition of being in a relationship you're not in control of what the other person does and so it's anxiety provoking what's going to happen next what if she reacts this way what if i can't articulate this what if we just go down the rabbit hole and 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 or you know or or your spe- ever know that that whoosh that you get your your partner says something and you're just whoosh you like electrified and you know they use that word that really bends your pick and you and you're off to the races with this stuff that's that's the anxiety I'm talking about and I'm talking about how we can stay in the middle that that we some people will offload their anxiety and other people will stuff it down but staying in the middle is when we sort of when we manage or carry our anxiety i talk about it like a waiter carrying a tray that's per, you know balanced with a lot of plates sometimes it feels like that and i we have to we have to stay present and and steady ourselves and not letting our anxiety just take over now, how much of that anxiety would you say comes from a level of insecurity? And so, for instance, when you have the person that says, you know, um, you know, I shouldn't have to tell you, you know, uh, you know, how much I love you. If you really knew me and you really loved me, you would know how to do that. Right. Right. Or I said it once early on and it hasn't changed. Why should I have to update it? Um you know, I, yes, it comes from insecurity. Uh, the anxiety comes from, it, you know, the more the more unsteady you are about yourself, the more easily toppled you are by your partner's words or actions. I mean, I've known people to be 
uh, you know, feel, you know, absolutely, completely disregarded when they've done the dishes and then their spouse says, by the way, would you also take out the trash? Well, you know, don't you, don't you appreciate me? And they're kind of, and they go off with that. So yeah, anxiety can touch off our own sense of insecurity or our own sense of inadequacy. And so, um, you know, so people have to take, you know, we, well, we have inside work to do in order to be steady. You, you use the word appreciation and I, you know, and I, in my independent work with a lot of couples and um, the work that I do, I hear that word a lot and credit appreciation um, is this is again to me as I think about it, as I'm saying it, this is an individual issue, not a couple's issue, yet it becomes a couple's issue. Well, you know, there's, the, you know, the the thing that the my kind of my whole one to tango notion isn't is it's not about uh, each person turning themselves into a little island of self sufficiency and not needing anything or wanting anything. Uh, we all want to be loved and appreciated. We want affection. We want to be told, um, you know, that we're important. We want to be thanked. Uh, we want to wake up to a smile. I mean, that's this, this, I mean, we're in relationships because it's, you know, to be bonded as a pair. But what happens is that people can, you know, I, I, I think of it as, as appreciation and affection and validation. These are really lovely and fine things to want. But what happens is, is they're not such a great thing to need. So if you, if your partner's in a bad space or angry at you or, you ha or you're with somebody who withdraws for days, which is really awful, this kind of icy thing, people have to learn how to be, how to comfort themselves during those times so that they don't actually need to get, so that they're not thrown off by the stuff that's actually not about them. If you have a partner who withdraws, it's not about you. Yeah, now we, th that's a great point when you talk about the withdrawal, but what is the partner supposed to do? I mean, obviously you love this person, you care about them, and they withdraw. Now, on the one hand, if you say, look, it's your responsibility, get yourself out of this, that doesn't come off as the most loving thing, but at the same time, you can't make it all about yourself as well and try and put it on yourself. So how how is there a balance in there to where you can help them but not take on that responsibility yeah i mean i think for in the in that instance it begins with letting the person know the impact so when you withdraw i have to tell you that i feel afraid or i really feel like you don't love me or sometimes i just think this is the beginning of the end or it causes me to feel a sense of panic or you know when you do that it's just like when i was a kid i'd get sent to my room for hours on end is really distressing to me so you you're you, you know you presenting what it's like for you some withdrawers actually don't even really think they're doing anything they don't realize how mean or painful it is they often say well i'm not doing anything i'm just you know i'm just kind of licking my wounds i'm not hurting you which is not the case so there's some number of people who are surprised to discover that it's actually quite hurtful. But then there are people who really just don't, they don't know how to regulate themselves better than to just shut down. And it's painful, but you know, I mean, it's kind of like what I say, and this may sound too dismissive, but I wanna to say to the person whose spouse is withdrawing, I wanna say, okay, f start with the idea that this is really a bummer for me. And now what do I want to do with myself? You know, this is not ideal. I'm, you know, we're not talking about how we should live with you know, totally intolerable circumstances, but, but, but we've all got something to deal with. A withdrawer or somebody who flares or somebody who works too much or, you know, there's just gonna be something. And so if you're with a withdrawer, you, you have to figure out what are you going to do so that you're not completely devastated or thrown off. And, I, you know, I worked with one guy who realized that, you know, when, when his wife was in this place, there was nothing he could do. So he would take long walks with the dog and he would read more. And he found that he could make himself 
much more comfortable and just, you know, wait until his wife warmed up. I know another person who, who, who cajoled a little bit uh, said, so are you going to spend the entire day, you know, caught up in your thing or can we go take a hike? And the husband said, no, I'm, too, I'm like way too upset. And so five minutes later she came back and she said, okay, what about now? And and it just caught the guy. It caught the guy's sense of humor. It was like you know that that they'd always they, they'd always figured it would be hours. And so she came back. I don't know, less than five minutes, two mm-hmm. minutes later, and said, "What about now?" And he realized that it was sort of silly that he was caught up in this. And you know, so you so you you experiment. You know, you talk about the withdrawer and the flarer, and I I was on Facebook this morning and saw another, you know, friend get married, and people have such good intentions and optimism when they get married, and it's at some point, obviously, based on the statistics I mentioned at the beginning, this idea of marriage becomes so much more difficult to navigate than people expect. Is it because of these flare-ups and this withdrawal, or is there other kind of big, you know, things that lead to it? I think there's a handful of reasons that marriage is hard. Um, You know, first of all, if you think about it, marriage puts two people into a small space with the expectation of keeping them there for a lifetime. And, And it doesn't, and it's like, and it's almost like, and then it says, okay, good luck. I hope you do great. But people come, they're lacking skills. They, you know, marriage doesn't come with a guidebook. Uh, People don't come with instruction manuals. And many of us have really unrealistic expectations. We think if people fight, that's a marriage death knell. Or if you don't fight, it means everything's okay, but really some stuff is just getting shoved under the rug. Or people have terrible role models. So many people have, you know, divorced parents or you know, angry parents or um, parents who never related or weren't affectionate. And so they don't have a good model for how to deal with the inevitable difficulties. And I, I think that, that that combination of things or the fact that, you know, a lot of people don't like the idea that they ha- they're a beginner. So when marriage gets to be difficult, they somehow think they should have Maybe they've picked the wrong person, or they should be better at it. But I just think marriage is hard, and we all have lots to learn. Well, when you just mentioned the point about being a beginner, um, it it really got me thinking. Now, on the one hand, yes, you would think that being a beginner, you're going to it's going to be harder to handle. You're going to you know maybe have some struggles as you're learning certain things, but yet all the statistics show that there is a higher divorce rate in your second and third marriage. So what are we, are are we not losing things? I mean, are we not not learning (laughs) Um, things or are we losing something that, that we should have gained from that? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated because when you were giving the divorce statistics, Actually, the, the statistics for first marriages is much better. So we can, like the, the divorce rate's only down around 33%. So you have two-thirds chance of actually being successful. You know, when people say it's 50-50, it makes it sort of seem like a, like a game, game of chance or a crapshoot. But when you say, you know, only one-third of first marriages, people end up divorcing, you know, it, makes, it, it sort of increases the odds. But but I think in in you know sometimes I've I've known people with you know two three four marriages and the the more marriages you have the the more likely you are to divorce but I think some of that comes from you know some of those people the five marriage people they're probably not really marriage material <laughs> and so you know it's like they're looking for you know a con- extended courtship or when things get difficult. They think it's their partner. So, so if we, but if we, if we ditch all those kind of statistic makers, and we stick with the one and two marriages, sometimes people's second marriages are better. Some people have what I call starter marriages. You know, they got married at eighteen, or married a few years, or I've known people who married somebody and they knew right at the outset that this was a bad idea, and that those marriages, you know, didn't last so much. But unfortunately, I think what you said is right. I think a lot of people don't 
aren't learning what they need to learn. Um, you know, the, stati- the state of couples therapy, couples therapy has gotten better over time, especially as there are people who really specialize in working with couples and don't just try and glue couples back together, but help them actually kind of, I like to think of it as like handle the rough and tumble of marriage. And, you know, one of my favorite things to do early in the, somewhere in the first session with every couple, I say to them, of course you're struggling. Marriage is hard. Marriage is hard for all of us. Marriage is hard for me. And people are deeply relieved because many people just think they're the only ones struggling. Well, um, we're going to take a break. But again, if if you think you're marriage material, stay with us because coming up, we're going to talk about the truth of what makes couples happy. We'll be right back. Founded over 30 years ago to meet the needs of families in crisis. West Shield has continually focused on resolving issues that negatively impact families and businesses. Our signature therapeutic transportation service helps to ensure that adolescents in crisis are safely transported to specialized schools, programs, and treatment centers with unsurpassed experience and success. We are supported by our full-service licensed investigation agency that has legally, professionally, and compassionately located hundreds of runaways and teens. We are experienced and qualified to help, offering solutions which may include referrals to our international network of top professionals in the fields of educational consulting, psychology, psychiatry, and investigations. Simply put, West Shield Adolescent Services and West Shield Investigations are the best solutions when your family is facing a personal crisis. Call 1-800-899-8585, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. That's 1-800-899-8585. Or visit our website at westshield.com. Thank you. Welcome back to Answers for the Family. Our guest is Winifred Riley. The book is It Takes One to Tango, How I Rescued My Marriage with Almost No Help from My Spouse and How You Can Too. Winifred, in the uh, in the book, one of the chapters talks about kind of coming up with this idea of what makes couples happy. Um, will you, without giving the whole book away, will you kind of chat a little bit about that for us yeah you know the 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 first thing that i say is a little bit of kind of comes on the heels of what i was just saying that one of the surprising things about happy couples is that they're not always happy that they take conflict in stride that they manage difficulties that they don't uh have have a hard time and then think you know i've married the wrong person uh, but the most surprising thing is that um, is that people actually have to make themselves happy. People think, you're supposed to make me happy, but no one else can actually make us happy. We can certainly uh, make each other miserable <laughs> in many ways and, and, and not, you know, um, you know, and contribute to a lot of difficulty in relationships. But if, but if you're going to stay in a marriage... This is so. So here's how I how I see it. I see it that people have two choices. Marriage is a choice. You can stay in a marriage, or you can leave your marriage. But if you're going to stay, you're left with two options. You can either figure out what to do with yourself in relation to your spouse and all the challenges that come with that, or you can let the situation drive you completely nuts. And I, and I really don't say this as a joke, that, that whatever difficulty you're going to face, I don't, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not so pro-marriage that I think no matter what's going on, people have to stay. But I really want to support people who want to stay to figure out how to make themselves as happy as possible, which isn't the same thing as living under miserable 
conditions. You know, as I as we were talking before, I think part of a healthy relationship is that we have to have the courage to address the issues that are going on. But if we go back to the person who was dealing with the withdrawing spouse, he actually had to figure out how to make himself happy without changing his partner. And she was aware that that this was not, a, you know, an ideal behavior. But, but but while she was in the process of figuring out what to do with herself besides shut down, he had to figure out how to make himself happy. And and what we what happens when you do that is that you actually suddenly feel quite free and whole and expansive that you're no longer dominated by your partner's crummy behaviors or uh, a bad mood or you know or or somebody who you know has a has a temper that you figure out where you're going to position yourself and how to you know and and you and people end up saying that they like themselves better yeah and i think that's important obviously you know we want to be able to raise each other up and and not only liking your partner but liking yourself is going to be incredibly important and we have a listener question that has come in and again i want to thank the listeners that take the time to do this uh, to send something in. This one reads, even after months of marriage counseling, my husband and I are still having difficulties. He has the attitude that he should be catered to at every turn, a pattern that goes back to his childhood with a mother who waited on him hand and foot. Do you really believe your book could help me change this kind of deep-seated problem? And this is from Wendy in Louisiana. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think that's that's quite a common thing. People come in with very different expectations of marriage. They have different uh, ideas of what the, their roles are going to be, uh, whose job is going to be what. Uh, this is not an, a simple thing, uh, but it, but you know, to Wendy, I would say. Do the parts, you know, do what you want in the marriage. Contribute the, as much as you would like to contribute. And your partner may be surprised or disgruntled or think you're supposed to be doing more, but that's still not your job. So I think you can begin to upset the, the status quo with that because, but you would have to first be able to tolerate your, your spouse wanting you to be different we would all, you know, you would like him to be different. He would like you to be different. And so you can begin to change that, the dynamic. He's not, it's not pretty. You know, this is not kind of magic wand stuff. But if you learn to tolerate the fact that he wishes that you were doing more and you do what you do and you calm yourself down and you feel okay, it'll start to shift. I can't promise how it will go or what it will look like but getting hooked in to arguing about whose job is what and what you should do and what you shouldn't do is keeping you on this hamster wheel and so i would just experiment and i think in my book i talk about uh, the ways different people deal with uh their their the desires that are different people wanting different things people uh, being disappointed we all have to learn how to be disappointed and we have to also learn what to do when our partner is disappointed in us without uh, freaking out or fighting you know it's funny you said hamster wheel because when i read the book i loved the um the cartoon that you talked about with the hamster wheel <laughs> will you will you share that for yeah. us yeah so because i just think yeah it's a good yeah thing. yeah it's, it's this, great yeah i have this favorite cartoon it sits right up next to my desk and there's uh, two, two hamster wheels. Uh, one has a hamster running around, sweating, a, a fat, you know, just running and running. And the other one is just sitting on the edge of the wheel uh, with his legs crossed, kind of leaning back. You almost think he's going to be drinking a martini or something. And the caption says, I've had an epiphany. And I really think that that's, that's the thing. We, you can have an epiphany about the wheels that you're running around on. And then you stop. It, it's, it's remarkable. People talk about the moment they realize that they could get off the wheel 
and the and, and issues just start to disintegrate because you're not running, you're not playing your part in keeping this thing going. And and you and you know people say, you know, it's just suddenly it occurred to me that never before did I think I could do such and such, and then I just did it. Or wow, I just suddenly said this. Or the next thing I knew, we were doing that. And it, it kind of sneaks up on people in that kind of way. In the, you step off the wheel, and then who knows what happens next. Well, I think that's a great analogy, but taking that one step further, what happens when one partner steps off the wheel and the other one refuses to? Well, if you think about it, there's, you, you can't have a tug of war where without two people tugging. There's this old quote from Seneca, very old, from Roman times, okay, and it's, a quarrel is quickly ended when deserted by one part. A quarrel is quickly settled when deserted by one party. There is no battle lest there be two. Well, that's a good point. Um, and what I was thinking was more just from a lifestyle standpoint. So, you know, a lot of us are caught up in the rat race, and so we've got, you know, two, two parents working, and the kids are going to school. Well, now you have a situation to where the kids have graduated, they've gone, they've moved away, and you have one person that steps off the wheel and says, you know what, it's time to move to a more rural area, it's time to slow down our pace, it's time to to focus on on mindfulness, and the other one is still going, and they're still going at that pace, and I think yeah. this is where you see a lot of people start to grow apart. Well, this is a point, yes. I mean, I, I've got many friends where one person is retiring and the other person's not ready to end work. These are things we call desire differences, desire discrepancies. It's not just sex where people have desire discrepancies. Someone wants to move to the country or work less or save more or vacation more. And the other, and it's not the other person's first choice. And this is where I say life gets interesting. And I don't want people to give up on the thing that they want just because they meet resistance. I'm not suggesting people just go off and buy their own house in the country, but this is where relationship work comes in, where we have to be persuasive, we have to be patient, we have to talk to each other. We have to listen to each other. We have to be curious. We have to be courageous. These sorts of big decisions, are we going to both retire? Are we going to move to a smaller place? Are we going to, who knows, are we going to hire a gardener? These things, when, when you can't agree, people have to actually have conversations. You, you, can't dis, you can't agree to disagree about things like this. And so the only way progress is actually made is that it's you have to be clear what you're asking your partner to give up. You have to be, you know, both sides. If I, if let's say I want another kid and you, you say, no, let's, we, I just want to have two. In that moment, somebody is going to give up the thing they want and how it gets decided is really important. It's, you know, somebody is going to have to be generous. I would never say have another kid and resent it. So you have to be generous. You have to know that you're asking your partner to give up something important. This is where not being particularly selfish is a good idea. We have to have it. We have to be self full and, and keep in mind our own interests. But when you're deciding something like that, you have to think about the impact of your, if I get what I want, this is what's going to happen. And people have to work with these things so there is actually isn't a winner and a loser. And th this also takes time. And people who are not used to this, when faced with these big decisions, sometimes someone will just say, you know, it's like a sit down strike. Well, I'm just not going to do it. But in the long run, that's not really going to give you you know, a satisfying outcome. So I say to people a lot, you know, it's, it's change is a thing that's like fail seven times, stand up eight. You try this, you try that, you talk about it this way, you talk about it again, you raise your concerns. It's not fast. 
You know, we've talked about so many different areas of marriage, and I feel like uh, we left out one piece, which to me seems like the biggest marriage killer in the the people that I've you know work with or the stories that I've heard. And our listener Deborah from Utah is writing in. Um, the issue I'm just thinking about is cheating in a marriage, and Deborah. Uh, writes in that my closest friends just separated two weeks ago. From the outside, everything looking wonderful, but I now know, have come to learn that my friend's husband has been cheating on her for over two years. She's finally given in trying to fix it, his need to be with other women. Depressed and feeling very insufficient, I'm not sure really how to reach out and help her. Maybe is it too late if I purchased your book and gave it to her? Is it something that would help her moving forward or even saving her marriage? Well, you know, First of all, it's it, there's not it's it's a very painful thing to find out that that you've been betrayed by your spouse. Uh, a surprising seventy five percent of couples, when they work with it, actually end up with a better marriage than they had before. Uh, but sometimes the 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 person who's having the affair just wants to keep going, and you really can't make someone want to be married to you. So it depend, you know, without knowing all of the details, it's it's certainly worth. I I, always, I I think that if one person wants to to uh, try and save the marriage, they should go for it. There's no guarantee, uh, but I don't. I think people sometimes give up too soon because their spouse looks unwilling. But you can't make an unwilling partner want to be married to you. And when you, you know, when it comes to affairs, there are a lot of reasons why people have affairs. And they're not all, they're not all because the person is a bad person. You know, there's loneliness, there's disconnection in the marriage. Often people have affairs, has nothing to do with their marriage. Um, Esther Perel talks about how many people will have an affair on the heels of some kind of tragic loss, a death in the family, or a health scare, um, or, the, or their best friend dies, and people think, what am I doing? I, you know, I have to live. Life is too short. So it's very complicated. Um, you know, so without knowing everything that's happening with your friend, um, I think if your friend wants to explore what she can do, uh, my book would certainly give her ideas in terms of how to position herself in a strong way. But, you know, she may also decide in the end that she wants to leave. People leave their marriages from strong places or they leave their marriages from a place of, of, of anxiety and giving up. And it's, it's different. But, but, you know, people don't have to stay married. Now, you know, we all know that that's certainly one of the biggest things that people fight about. But, uh, Winifred, what are people fighting about? And do couples tend to have the same fights over and over? Uh, are they focusing <clears throat> on the content, which leaves them blind to what's actually going on behind them? Yeah, people fight about nothing. They fight about sh where should we, which way to hang the toilet paper and which way to turn, you know, when you're going to the freeway. People get on these loops, their hamster wheel fights, where to park, how to park, uh, who said what, who used a bad tone, who, you know, and, and so people get distracted by the content of their fight when uh, what, what's really going on that they're fighting about what I call big picture issues. They're fighting about trust. They're fighting about commitment. They're fighting about power and control. They're fighting about, as we were talking earlier, self-esteem issues. You know, if, if my self-esteem is wobbly and you say, you know, I really, I really would like for us to, I'd like to kiss more slowly, or I'd like, you know, I'd like for us to go dancing. And if my self-esteem is wobbly, we might fight about, I feel like you're criticizing me. And we will slide off of the issue of, so what do you want to do about kissing? How do you want to change this thing? And so people are distracted by the content of their fight, which is why they go around and around. Um, what we have to do instead is slow down and actually begin to look at what's actually going on here. This was one of the things I did in my own marriage. When we were having our conflicts, I was so well-versed 
in all the things that my husband was contributing. He was stubborn. He was he liked to argue. He didn't know how to back down. But when I started to focus on myself, I discovered that I actually kind of like having the last word, and I'm maybe as stubborn as he is, and in fact, I probably start as many arguments as he does. These were things that I was unaware of while I was mostly focusing on how difficult I found him to be. And so we, you know, when I started saying, well, what's really going on here? I just began to discover one of the things, you know, were those behaviors of mine or that, you know, no argument was too stupid to engage in. And when I started to see these things, I could make some choices about how to not, not engage in that stuff. And so what people, I say to people, what are you really fighting about? What is really going on? And, 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 and you discover, oh, here's my stubbornness. Oh, here's my desire to be right. Oh, I think we're fighting about uh, who's more considerate. And, and so, you know, the, you go away from the content and you start to look at the big picture issues because you can't, you can't solve a problem that you haven't properly named. Now, one of the things that we see a lot now is is couples retreats, and I think because of the internet, you know, there's a way to get the information out there to people. Um, you know, I don't know about anybody else. I get these emails constantly. Um, what's your thought on couples retreats, and do you have any knowledge of how successful these are? Well, some are very successful. Um, you know, for some people, uh, a couples retreat. If, especially if they're given some useful tools, can be really terrific. For some people, they haven't spent more than a half an hour with each other uh, in you know in, in a decade. That they you know life is so full of kids and work and chores and laundry that that just the idea that you're carving out time for yourselves to pay attention to your relationship can be terrific for people. Um, You know, and so then if you're learning some tools and also being with other couples, again, we go back to that normalizing, oh, yeah, other people, other people struggle. I mean, I remember being early when we first had kids and you'd sit around with other parents, other families with young kids and you'd find out, really, nobody, everyone is really only having sex now and again. You know, we have this fantasy that everyone with a five-month-old is having, you know, lots and lots of sex, and it must just be you. So this normalizing that, that things are challenging and you're not different, and we can laugh at each, you know, we, that's why we laugh at New Yorker cartoons about marriage, because we see ourselves, because we all do these things. You know, you mentioned sex, and the word intimacy comes up a lot um, working with people. When you think of the word intimacy, what is it truly? I mean, I don't, you know, equate it definitely, you know, completely with sex, but the idea of intimacy, what does it really mean to you in a relationship? Yeah, you know, intimacy is a thing that we think happens to, together. It happens simultaneously. It's, it's about two people. But actually, intimacy is created when one person moves toward each other. So these convers- these difficult conversations that I'm talking about become very intimate as one person courageously moves toward the other to reveal what they are truly thinking and who they truly are. So intimacy is, is, and it is something that comes and goes. It's something that we create. I think it's another myth that people have that intimacy is a constant thing when what's true is that couples get disconnected most of the time. We actually are miscommunicating and being out of sync most of the time. That's not because something is wrong. That's just the way things are. And so we actually have to take an action. You know, I, I, I sort of, I use my hands where like I put my hands apart and then I have one hand moves toward the other hand which is like we have to we have to put ourselves back into sync rather than thinking something is wrong because we're not intimate or we're not connected. I remember I used to think that everybody else was having this sort of constant state of lovey doveyness and there was something wrong with my marriage. And then I realized, no, actually it's it's a thing we create. It's not mm-hmm. just a given. It's not a constant. 
Well, the book is called It Takes One to Tango. Uh, Winifred, thank you so much for coming on. And for anybody out there, if you would like to get more information, uh, you can go to the website speakingofmarriage.com. Uh, and again, if you're driving and you can't yeah, write well, that's it. my website. Uh, okay. That's my blog site, but okay. the book has its own website. Sorry, and my the book is one to tango dot com. Okay, so it's 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 one to tango dot com, or speaking of marriage dot com. And again, if you're driving out there and you can't write these down, you know you can always go to answersforthefamily dot com. We will have all of Winifred's information on the site. Winifred, thank you so much for coming on and for talking about what is truly an important subject, I think, for everybody out there in a relationship. Well, thank you so much for having me. And all our listeners, please be sure to put us on your calendar and tune in next Monday when we are joined by Oriana Murphy, Associate Executive Director of Sober College Programs, as we talk about Rehab Redefined for Young Adults. And if you missed or you want to share our show with your friends, please visit our archives of past interviews at AnswersForTheFamily.com. You may also subscribe or resubmit your name to download your free copy of the Attitude of Gratitude Journal, your 21-day guide to achieving the quality of thankfulness through self-discovery. And the next time you're on Facebook and Twitter, please remember to stop by our page and check some of our latest posts. And if you like them, please like us and spread the word. And be with us next week on Answers for the Family. Thank you. You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza and Matt Polachek, only on L.A. Talk Radio.